see what the weather's like in Cornwall as we go over to Tori Amos. Good afternoon, Tori. Hey, Ray, how are you? Hey, good. You're coming in loudly and clearly there. That's because I'm in a recording studio here oh, in Cornwall. Nice. It's in the barn. And, and you know, that's one thing I miss as well is, is good quality lines because we're talking to people <laughs> on mobile phones and WhatsApp lines and all sorts of things. So it's good to hear you coming in loudly and clearly. Uh, well, thanks. Can I just say, I, if, I were in, if I were in Ireland, I would love to help Neve out because I can't <laughs> tell you how many singing roosters I've given a ride to over the last 30 years. I can't count them all. So come, come on, peeps, help Neve out. Uh, and you know the road as well because you live down in Kinsale. I know the road and I know the roosters, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. How long ago is it that you lived in Kinsale? Uh, we got the place there in 95. Right. So we were in Delgany recording this record called Boys for Pele. And we recorded in a church there, part of it. And then we recorded in the Bally William down in Kinsale. Mm. It was big news at the time that Tori Amos was recording in a church out in, out in Delgany. It was big news. I remember driving past and going, I wonder is she in there? I wonder is she in there? I was in there all the time. We're in the graveyard. We were recording in the graveyard or, or of course, the crew was down at a pub yes. close yeah. by. Um, congratulations on the book, uh, Resistance, a songwriter story of hope, change and courage. I have to admit, it took me a while to get into your rhythm. Okay. But once I did, I really enjoyed it. Because it, it well, thank you. It's a very personal book, isn't it? It's... Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's um, it uses songs as a time machine and to really take you through um, me getting kicked out of the conservatory and then my, my minister father taking me to um, try and get a job at 13 because yeah. I, I was a failure by then having gotten kicked out of the conservatory. So, you know, and us going to the only place you'd give us a chance and he didn't realize we were in a gay bar. So that was that's how the book really begins. With the, uh, but it wasn't just any uh, gay bar. It was in Washington. Um, that's so right. So you, as a teenage girl, were eavesdropping on some very important conversations and it made you very politically aware from a young age. Yeah, for the next seven years, I played um, congressional parties and I played the happy hour circuit um, as well as the late circuit. So, so I did... I, I, sorry, I did the rounds there yeah. and, um, you know, the liquid handshake and all that. That was, that was really how I learned how Washington operated. What's the liquid handshake? It's how the deals are made. Uh -huh. So um, really it's about um, people investing money in their politicians if they, if they can be bought and if they um, invest quite a lot of money, then they, they have a lot of sway over that politician. And um, there were um, business types who would invest in quite a few of them, hoping that one day even they might be able to It'd invest in yeah. the presidency. Yeah. Uh, and your dad, still alive, uh, was yes. a preacher. Um, and yes. I, I suppose people would find it funny that he was then delivering you into what some people would describe as a den of iniquity. Um, uh, and wh what was the thinking there? You've obviously had the chat. What was the thinking there? Oh, we've had the chat. You know, they thought he was in a costume because the guys looked like um, variations of, you know, could be a lumberjack, oh, yeah. could be a congressman, <laughs> could be a deacon from church. You know, the, all the looks were represented, yeah. Ray. So when um, the con congregation found out that my father did this, he, he took a lot of... He took a lot of shtick for it, and um, and he said, "Really, is there a safer place for a teenage girl than an all gay bar? Yeah. Really?" <laughs> uh, you were in that conservatory from a very young age, from the age of four. So, yeah, five, yeah, five. Sorry, sorry, yeah, better get the facts right. Um, and you you recount what your mother saying to you that you nearly were came out of the womb playing music. Um, and what was were you surrounded by it in your childhood? Who was who was singing and who was playing instruments in the house? Well, my grandfather, he had a beautiful tenor voice, and my mother worked in a record store, so she, I, she hadn't planned on being a minister's wife. So she brought her LPs with her, and when my father would go to church with his dog collar, the apron would come off, and she was like the best DJ ever. <laughs> 
That's a playing Pat Swyler. Yeah, yeah. You know, just amazing music. And then my brother was 10 years older than I, so he brought that devil music in. Uh -huh. And it had to get out before my father came in. So I'd be playing the doors in between Mozart and hope disguising it so my father wouldn't know that, you know, I was completely corrupted. Yeah. Eight. Um, you, you had a lovely relationship with your mother and, and you lost her last year. Um, but, but she'd had a stroke in 2017 and... That that song, I presume, it's about your mother Mary's eyes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and when she, it was a pretty serious stroke. Um, and did you feel that you'd lost her then, even or? Oh yeah. Yeah. We felt we'd lost her then, and that's why it, the the stroke was cruel, um, and she could she could barely move um, her her body. She had to have complete care, and she couldn't speak and. There were times my sister, who's a doctor, didn't think that she was completely present. But then she would look at you and you knew she was present. So mm. it was that kind of um, severe type of stroke. And yet when she died, I, I thought I'd be relieved. But really then I could remember this incredible human being, that my favorite person really in the world. I, I was able, allowed to remember my best friend, which was my mom. And I kind of went into a, a, a real place of grieving. And so it, it took me a while. You know, I don't think we know how grief is going to to affect us, whether it's personal grief, like somebody you love and, and lose, or collective trauma, like we're going through now in this cataclysm that we're all living through. Mm. She was a very wise woman. Um, uh, and you imagine conversations with her. Yes. Yeah. Describe how that happens. Because so you're, are you sitting somewhere on your own and then she appears or what way does it work? Well, it, you know, it doesn't happen as often as I'd like, but in the, in the book, there's a conjuring that's going on and evoking of, of her looking in on um, me grieving and really not being there for my daughter. Um, and her kind of shaking me awake in the book, talking me through it. So she's always was the strong one and the clear one. And she's she's talking about, um, I'm so sorry that this stroke traumatized you so much, Tori Ellen. But now, can't you let me have this one? I'm the one that's dead, not you. Yeah. You have a daughter in the other room. Now go. You know how to give love, so stop wallowing. And it was that moment, Ray, I think, that really kind of finally I was able to then dance with the amazingness of Mary, who was mom, and, and kind of call on her every day. I have chats with her now. It's, it's different now that it's been a year. Um, I'm not in the, in the deep, deep darkness of it like I was soon after. Um, this is a quote from your mother that I'm going to keep with me, I'd say, for the rest of my life. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, she, she, she'd, uh, an important question that you must ask yourself, which one of my flaws has gotten out of the back seat and is now driving the car? <laughs> it's, yeah. When we're behaving a certain way, we just have to question ourselves, don't we, and check ourselves. What part of you is making you behave this way? Which flaw? And it's, yeah, it's, she was great, right, with that kind of thing. She, she was very quiet usually, and an observer. But then, when people would stop talking, <laughs> she would just let you gab on, and then she would just drop these pearls on you. You know, just yeah. this pearl, and you think, okay, okay, I'm going to take that with me, mom, for the rest of my life. Thank you. And. Um, you you talk in the book about the process of writing and your muse and you give the songs are sort of, they're she's, they're always female. You were yes. female, obviously. <laughs> but but, but you, you describe how they, they come to being. And it was, a friend of yours was a Kavita who, and she sort of inspired the book because she said that she couldn't listen to a melody and lyrics at the same time. So she'd missed a lot of what you were saying in your songs. Yes. And she was making this beautiful Indian food. And she said, can you please read a few for me? And we'd had a little bit of wine. So I said, OK, well, you pick. She goes, OK. 
So we, she just started picking things, and I would. I couldn't, can't remember the lyrics, so she'd get them up for me. Sometimes they were right, sometimes they were wrong on the on the computer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'd read them to her with adjustments. And she'd look at me and say, I had no idea that's what you were talking about. No idea. Hmm. Probably one of your, your most powerful songs is uh, Me and a Gun, and there's no really... Um, uh, there's no mistake as to what that's about. Uh and, and that was in your, your 20s. I'm just wondering how your parents reacted to that or did you tell them um, about the, the old sexual assault or did that happen later on? We didn't talk about it. At all? My, my mother couldn't talk about it. She couldn't talk about it. So we didn't talk about it. Hmm. There was that um, harrowing for her. So it was just not something we talked about. She was a very smart and um, present human being. So she, at the concert, she heard it sung. And it was just something she couldn't, we couldn't talk about, or she would, you know, weep, be mm. very, very upset. And so so that's just, you, you have to be aware of how things affect other people. And so you make those adjustments and mm. um, that's what that was. And, and as a result of that song, I would imagine that over the years, the 28 years or so since uh, you, you, you released it, that women have shared their stories with you over and over again. Over and over again. And um, I think the, the real concern about this time, um, hearing from people that work at RAIN in the States, which is the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network there, that's the national hotline, is that normally you have a teacher or... Um, they are the safety net. So they can tell when a child is being assaulted and they're the ones that then call the hotline or encourage the child to call the hotline. And during the past two, three months, that safety net hasn't been there yeah. for most kids. And that's the deep concern about coming out of lockdown, um, how many haven't had that support. So that's... That's where we are right now. It's a very scary prospect, isn't it? Oh, yeah. To think and about it's real. what's it's happening real. behind closed doors. And as you say, no, none of those supports out there to spot the signs. Um, no. Yeah, no. it gives me shivers when I think about it. It's, it's, or, or, there's, I don't know what we can do about it. Well, that's why I think, Ray, coming out of this, we're going to have to be really conscious and aware that if some people have had a Buddhist retreat during this time, then that's then then that's positive, mm. and that's really great. But there will be those out there that really need our help, that need our to listen to them, need their support, and and they're going to need to heal, and it won't just happen overnight. And not just heal; some of them are. <laughs> in a home where the predator has access to them. Yeah. So I think that's just something we just need to be conscious of. That's going on while others are able to sun outside or, you know, I'm not at all making light that those that those people don't have challenges as well. But this is something that's happening that it's kind of, you know, going on without people really shining a yeah. light on it. Uh, and what about the Me Too movement and Time Out movement and uh, sort of, you know, 28 years after you recorded that song. Um, how did you feel about all that? Were you excited that it was finally getting the exposure and the platform? That yeah, well, for a long time, people have been knocking on those walls that have built up in every industry. Well, it's not just the entertainment industry, banking everywhere. And um, finally, the wall started to shake. And it was because of this pressure that people were demanding that people in positions of power had to act differently. Some of them would have continued on, but some are being forced to um, make adjustments because of these movements. So, yeah, that's mm. that. That was an exciting shift. You write in the book about the uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and Brett Kavanaugh case. Um, and RAIN, that uh, organisation that you're connected with, Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network, they got a huge spike in calls around that time. Oh, yes. 
Yeah, they did. And yes, they did. he won, I suppose. That's, it's, uh, can you countenance, can you understand why women would vote for Donald Trump? No. No, I, d- I don't really understand it. Do you try to understand? I try to listen and hear, but I don't, I, d- I don't understand the appeal there. I, I, I don't. Mm. So, and I can't speak for them. A lot has happened since he was elected in 2016. He's going for election again. And you say in the book that, that things like you know, Me Too and Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford are a sort of a call to action for women. That, that they now need to act. And I suppose the easiest way to act is not vote for Donald Trump. Well, and the key here is in the United States, we are voting for a system of government. We are either going to vote for, we're not voting just for a person now. Mm. We're voting for a system of government. So we're either going to vote for a type of democratic government or an authoritarian regime. And you have to look at it. it, He's telling you everything you need to know um, by dismantling what our forefathers and foremothers built in the United States. So that's what we're doing. We're voting for one or the other. Yeah, not necessarily for the personality. Um, You write as well about uh, 9-11 and you were in New York at the time and then you hightailed it down to Florida only to hightail it back up to New York to be the first music act on David Letterman uh, when they went back on air after um, after 9-11. Talk to us about that that, because... Choosing the song to sing was important for you. Yeah, it was a huge responsibility because at that time, the one thing I'd learned in Washington playing all those years as a teenager was it was it's a war of ideas. And those war rooms are carved out um, off the K Street corridor, just a few blocks from the White House. And this war of ideas was occurring as it is now, Um right after 9-11, where the narrative was um, the hawks were were drumming for war. And as I was going back on that bus from Florida, I traveled a few thousand miles in a few days, was that the truckers, they weren't there yet. We'd stop at the truck stops. They, They weren't on the narrative for war yet. They were upset. They were grieving. They, they were having all kinds of emotions, um, but they weren't there yet. And so I thought the song that we choose has to be the right one. And I thought about Imagine, which would be banned. They banned Imagine. Why so? Beca- because um, um, imagine, imagine all the people, people living, living life in peace. Yeah. They didn't want us singing that. Uh-huh, they, they didn't, didn't want, want us to imagine that. Right, okay. God. Yeah. So I, but I picked Tom Waits because the song Time was the one that I felt um, mirrored what I was seeing from, from the people, the rawness, the pain. And, and also, though, they hadn't chosen war yet. So I wanted to hold a space for a different choice without realizing that they were going to war those hawks no matter what. Mm. Uh, I was watching back your performance. I'm going to play a little bit of it, of it, of it now, but it, it was just uh, notable that the reaction of the audience that night was muted. It, was, it was, wasn't the usual raucous David Letterman audience. Um, you know, and you could get a sense that things had changed in New York. Uh, and this is your perform- a bit of your performance. And it's time, time, time. And it's time, time, time. And it's time, time, time that you love. And it's time. You've done a lot of cover versions over the years and you talk in the book about, uh, and that's why I was saying at the top, getting into your rhythm. You talk about um, getting permission from the songs. Yes. To change them. 
Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. So how does that work? Well, you sit down at the piano and you, you start singing it and then the song sort of goes, no, sorry, Tori, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to let you do mm-hmm. that. <laughs> the, if you really ask, sh- show me your secrets. Right. They will. Yeah. If you know what you're doing and you can understand their structure and you can figure out their chordal information and their susses and what they're doing. And then you say, okay, would you like to hold a, a, a different dress, a different style or a different outfit? And they usually say, try it. Let's try it. <laughs> and sometimes I try it and it, I might go, you know what? I'm not the person. I'm not the artist to do justice to you. So thank you for showing me your secrets. And I think maybe you should go find Bjork. <laughs> 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 That's a Bjork one, yeah. Uh, so, how are things in Cornwall? You you live between Cornwall and Florida. Yes. Uh, and would you normally be in Cornwall this time of the year, or would you be somewhere else? Right now, I'd be um, on the book tour. We would we would have just done the Hay Festival, but we did the virtual Hay Festival, which we did here. It's normally in Wales, so we did that Monday night. That's a Q and A, and. Um, we did that virtually. So that's what I would have been doing right now. And then coming back to make a record for DECA and then touring before the election in America, I would have been touring in the autumn in the States. Right. So that's all shifted. But Cornwall is beautiful. And um, how I'm very grateful that I'm married to a sound engineer and we're in a recording studio and he's trapped with a musician. (laughs) (laughs) But will you congratulate him on the sound from his studio because it's it's crystal clear and it's lovely and you sound amazing. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) If only I'd known, I would have arranged for you to sing a song for us, but there you go. Maybe another time. Another time. Another another time, time, yeah. Um, The the book is um, Resistance, A Songwriter's Story of Hope, Change and Courage uh, and it's a great read and I've really enjoyed our chat. 